guys. Hi. Thank you, Joel. Thank you so much for that introduction. That's surreal. I'm going to change that. <laughs> Great. Um, <laughs> thank you to the entire Creative Mornings team. Thank you to the Hirshhorn. Um, a Creative DC is a project I've been working on for the last two and a half years. It is the most collaborative thing I have ever been part of. Um, I feel a lot of responsibility today because of that. I really want to get this right. Um, this was not an opportunity that I took lightly. So thank you guys so much for inviting me here. Thank you all here. Thank you for being part of this. Thank you for listening. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and jump right in. I'm going to elevator pitch you guys a little bit. Uh, my name is Morgan West. I am an artist. I'm a third generation DC small business owner. And I am founder and director of A Creative DC. So that is a social media campaign. Uh, we promote and we acknowledge creative community and creative economy in the city. We utilize existing media platforms to share perspectives. So on Instagram and Twitter, we're almost 100% reliant on user-generated content. So what that means is people can opt in, they can share their visuals, their photos, their tweets. All they have to do is use the Creative DC hashtag and that gives us permission then to share the content out across our channels. So one to three times a day, we are pushing visuals out to 75,000 followers on Instagram. We are retweeting all day long on Twitter, like probably obnoxiously if you have your alerts on, I'm really sorry, you probably turn them off. Um, but basically, it's not just things that are tagged, we're retweeting content that we think is relevant or that we think our audience is gonna find valuable, things we think they should know about. Um, also, we have a website, oh, oh there it is. Um, we have a website, every single day we are curating the homepage of that website. It includes a photo of the day feature um, closest to me and it also has like a weekly kind of larger gallery update. We also have a newsletter that emails out to subscribers that goes out about once a week. Um, it includes photos from the feed, um, just kind of stuff that we maybe don't have anywhere else to put. So, you know, we don't have a blog, we don't really have a place to do long form interviews. Our, um, our newsletter is a really good place to put that stuff. So that's a lot of content to be putting out. We utilize a lot of different channels, um, but having that many outlets, really, all we're doing with that is just trying to do justice to the amount of content that's being put in. Um, so on t in 2015, on average, the Creative DC hashtag was used once every four minutes. Um, it's heading towards three quarters of a million uses on that channel alone. Um, Twitter has its own hashtag feed. On both channels, um, on our website, down in the corner, all of our bios, we really, we make that hashtag feed clickable. So that's something we wanna direct people to. It's great if they're following our channels, but we're not ever really gonna be able to kind of represent everything on them. Um, so we want people to look at the feed itself. It's standalone from our content. Um, and the reason we do that is because there's just phenomenal work happening in that feed. So you are looking at imagery of artwork from the lobby of the Anacostia Art Center, and you're looking at that directly next to things that are happening across town at the Kennedy Center. Um, you're looking at full-time artists, full-time content creators. You're looking um, just at images of people who are kind of documenting their, da their daily lives, or walking past, you know, no King's murals that are, you know, on 14th Street. Um, the feed includes visuals from all four quadrants, all eight wards, it's food, it's art, it's theater, um, it's the inside of people's houses, it's their interior decorating projects, it's projects they're doing with and for other people. Um, the feed reflects protests and gatherings and movements and support, ethos and mission statements, and the cities and this country's celebrations and successes. So it is kind of this like giant real-time document of just things that are happening in DC. It's not comprehensive, but it does cover a lot. Um, and we've really, we've been able to build, you know, with this content, we've been able to build a really large audience of people who are taking it in. Um, we look at that audience as people who care about what's happening in DC, or at least they care enough to kind of let us like sneak into their media sphere <laughs> every day. Um, and on the other side of that, we're really looking at the people who tag, the people who are opting in their perspective, who are giving us permission to use it. You know, we like to think that those people are saying that our perspective counts, like my voice is, is larger when it's next to someone else's voice, and these are voices that deserve to be heard. Um, the biggest goal of the project since day one has really just to 
to amplify, like we want to be amplification um, because our voices are much louder when they are together. And those are the mechanics of it. So that's kind of the, uh, that's the what. We're reflective, we're representative of the community that opts in. We champion the emerging alongside the established. That's like a really big key piece for us. Um, and ultimately, we are just this digital access point. You know, we're in your pocket, we're on your phone. Um, we're an access point to content and perspectives that are unique to DC. So that's the what and the why of this is really why I'm so excited to be here today to talk to you guys specifically to this audience because you guys get it. Like you're coming from a starting point. Nothing I'm gonna say today is like gonna blow anyone's minds. Um, you already know that we are fighting just this fundamental, this local and a national misperception about what the city is, about who is here and about what it has to offer. So Washington DC is not the federal government. We are so much more than just the federal government. Our creative community exists. It's not emerging. It has been here a really, really long time, longer than any of us in this room. Um, DC is a real city and people live here. It's a problem that anybody thinks otherwise. It's harmful to our economy that people believe this. The creative community has gone underserved for a really long time here because of it and it's contributing to just this lack of equity across our entire creative economy. So there are a lot of people in projects who have kind of pinpointed this, they're working to shift this perception. People, again, have been at this for a really long time, but in the digital era especially, what I find exciting about working on this project now is that many hands really do make light work, and I think that we are kind of all in this together right now. So I'm gonna come back to all of this. We're gonna come back to a Creative DC. We're gonna jump around a little bit. Um, we are going back to the MySpace era, actually. So we're heading back to 2006. Um, I was really into street style blogs. Like this is, this is how I spent my time online. I was just like fascinated with what people were wearing in other cities. Um, I was reading just all day long, like the Sartorialist was based in New York and Face Hunter, if you guys remember that, that was in Paris. Um, Stockholm style, Every, everyone was, like representing their city, right? And I'm looking around and DC just has so much style, like I feel like it always has. And I thought we were more than worthy of being recognized for that. And like, why aren't we represented online? And so I'm kind of like looking around at what I have and I'm like, you know what, Blogspot is free. Like everyone started on Blogspot, the, start, the Sartorialist was on Blogspot. And you know, I've got, I've got a point and shoot and like I kind of know how to use it. And I have Microsoft Paint, right? Like, <laughs> that's, that's a tool. So I'm gonna show you guys what I did. I founded DC's first street style blog, and that's what it looked like, okay? It was not good. This is, I know how many designers are in this room. I am like melting inside right now. That's what it looked like. I had HTML for dummies, and like, this is what I came up with. Um, so really, like, zero qualifications. Intense enthusiasm, yes. Don't let anyone tell you that's half the battle. It's not. Um, I couldn't frame a photo. I'm gonna spare you guys visuals. I got this from the like waybackmachine.com and I was like so glad there was not an actual photo on there. Um, but still, like this took a lot of effort. Like even when it looks like this, it takes a lot of effort, right? <laughs> so I was very proud of this. I was very proud of my little project and I, I just took it upon myself to email the style writer at the Washington Post. And I was like, hey, I'm doing this. And she wrote about it. She published the URL and she was like positive. She like said nice things. <laughs> and like looking back, it's, I, I, it's unfathomable that it happened, but it did. And it did, and I, I grew a local audience because of that, and that was really exciting. So, you know, it's great when you're doing stuff, but it's also like really nice when people are looking at it. Um, and so, you know, beyond this local readership, which was really helpful, having eyes on it kind of forced me to get a little better. Um, but it was also getting like thousands of readers a day. So like not just local, like I'm looking at my stat counter or whatever, and people are looking at it in Greece, in France, in Japan, and like all over the world. And that's because the internet was a very different place in 2006. And I know that that kind of goes without, without saying, but like in particular to kind of the blogosphere, every blog had this like little sidebar situation over here. And in that sidebar, you just linked to everyone who was like doing kind of, who was in your field. And you know, there, it's like there wasn't really competition because you're all kind of in other cities and you're all just supporting each other. So I was linking out to like 50 different, you know, city street style blogs. 
50 other blogs were linking to me. And it was just crazy. And eventually, like, that kind of went away. Like, obviously, the internet has been redesigned a few times. <laughs> like, the sidebar kind of went away in general. Um, but also, I think once people started monetizing projects, they were more inclined to kind of keep their page views to themselves. But all of that really stuck with me. Um, there's just so much value there um, when someone else is helping you do the work, okay? So whether it's traditional media, like talking about what's happening in their city, or whether it's somebody from around the world who's never met you, it's really, really helpful. And I kind of really started to take in right there, like you have to have a mix of traditional and new media. Like one is not gonna cut it. If only people in Greece were reading this, it would not have been as effective. So a few years later, um, I kind of got a little tired of this format, and I transitioned the Street Style blog into an online art magazine. I was not on the design committee for this. <laughs> um, all, all credit go is due to my friend Eric Lofton. Um, but this was a project I worked on with him and a few other friends. We put out seven issues between 2008 and 2012. And really, it was just we were, we were making stuff, and our friends were making stuff. We were all really young, everybody was unestablished, like, you know, we're not, no one else is really publishing our work. So we were just kind of coming up with our own platforms and putting them out in a way that we thought was fresh or like that we kind of felt proud of. Um, I did want to share these two images. So this is by photographer Josh Kogan. Do any of you guys work at WeWork Wonder Bread? So this is the Wonder Bread factory, actually, before it was renovated. We like climbed in the window and spent the day there. And, but like, <laughs> it's fine. Um, but this is, you know, this is, this is the kind of stuff we were doing. So it was like fun little fashion spreads. There was just photo essays. You know, it wasn't anything like world changing, but it was beautiful. And it was just kind of showing like what we, what we were up to in DC. And the biggest thing that kind of came out of this project or I'd say like the thing I can point to and be like, yes, this was a project that was successful, was we landed this really positive, very wonderful print piece in Nylon Magazine. So we had some local readership that was super exciting. I had never really been featured anywhere nationally before. This was like crazy for all of us who were involved. They quoted like a bunch of different people who were involved in the project. It was insanely exciting. Um, we also had some, again, like just some kind of international press. So do you guys remember Style Bubble? Does anybody remember that? Yeah, so she, yeah, she, I think she's still, she's still working today, but she's, she's in London and she wrote very positively about it and I was working at Urban Outfitters at the time and like, I remember I was looking at her site on my Blackberry and like they, she had written about it and I cried in the bathroom because I was so happy, it was very cute. <laughs> Um, but kind of the through line, and again, like, I'm so grateful and was, it was just so humbling to, you know, have our work and our friends' work recognized, but, like, the through line on kind of all the press was, like, and, and this is happening even in D.C. Like, even in D.C. are people doing things that are creative, and, like, you don't, this is crazy, and I'm just like, this is not crazy. This is not crazy at all. And this was just kind of evidence that people just didn't have a lot of context for this city. So if, if they could just see really like what was happening here, I was convinced that this would not be a surprise. Project like the, projects like these, they're not a novelty. We weren't even the only people doing online magazines in DC. Like, there's, there's so much perspective here, right? So after this project kind of closed, I spent a few years writing a personal lifestyle blog. Um, it focused on what my, my creative lifestyle looked like in DC. Um, at that point, I was freelancing. Um, I was working with a lot of other DC small business owners. And I was mostly creating online and social media content um, for businesses and organizations. I did some work with the Human Rights Campaign, which was always, they're always wonderful to work with. Um, Gordy's Pickle Jar, Muni DC, Violet Boutique, um, I got a little better at street style, I'm proud to say. Um, and I was just, what I was doing is I was creating this work, I was documenting the creation of this work, and even though, like, I never, I still have a sidebar, by the way, this was like 2014. <laughs> I didn't, Squarespace came late to me. Um, but so, you know, I was, I was putting all this out and I never got the same kind of web traffic, like, ever again. I never even approached the same web traffic that the original iteration of this blog had. But it was still successful in the sense that I just kept getting more and more work, right? So I wasn't necessarily having to go out and find clients. People were finding me. And that just reinforced this idea that proof of concept is everything. 
right? So like if you have something you can point to, if, if, something can, if someone can just come across something themselves, like if they can Google it or if you just kind of like sneak your way into like the media that they're taking in, a lot of the work of convincing people that you can do something or that something exists, that's, it's already been done. So those are, those are kind of the hits of uh, 2006 to 2014. Um, those were eight years, it's a really long time. There were a lot of non-hits as well, but those are kind of the, the most relevant things. Um, we're now, we're at the end of December 2014. It was the end of the year. I had some downtime over the holidays, right? So like when you're, you know, when a lot of your clients are small business, like everyone's just kind of like dead after the holiday markets and it's just like this very quiet time before the new year. Um, I personally, I had just finished up this huge like outdoor um, art installation for a holiday market that was on the Southeast Riverfront. I was like cold, I was still cold from being on a ladder for a week. I was just tired and I was like just moping around my house and I was just feeling very reflective. Um, I was thinking about my career up until that point. Um, I, I like kind of don't know what to do with downtime so I'm like I think maybe I want to start another project. And I'm thinking about like my first project in this street style blog and I'm thinking about just how kind of wildly idealistic that had been. Um, I think at the time I really just thought like if I can start this blog, if I can just have this like one little URL, I'm gonna put photos up and people are gonna see it and they're gonna get it. Like that's gonna turn the tide because back then and even in 2014 and even now, I am constantly having to kind of justify the fact that like yes, I'm a creative person. Yes, I live in Washington, D.C. And yes, the creative life I live here is like full and diverse and thriving and it gives me everything I need. And the really, the idealism that I had in 2006 kind of centered around this logic that they're gonna look at it, they're gonna read interviews, you know, they're gonna see photos, they're gonna read interviews with like local shop owners and they're just gonna like get it. The pieces are gonna fall into place for people. They're gonna understand that we have a style scene that like Letty Gooch is here and Redeem is here and you know, it's independent retailers and it's artists and musicians and that that's gonna be proof of concept, right? Like that, that's gonna be proof of creative life in Washington, D.C. And there's a lot that was just so flawed about that. Um, as far as access points go, I mean, seriously, like a street style blog, it was, it still is, it's like a really kind of niche situation to try to occupy. It's one URL, it's one person's camera, or at least in my case, it was just one person really working on it. Um, and beyond that, it's just, it's not literal enough. So the scope, I felt, was too small to kind of really be successful and kind of help me, help me fight this little battle that I had, for whatever reason, decided to take on. Um, and on the other side of that, you know, like, yeah, the scope was small, but I do still, and at the time, I really believe that localism and, act, you know, activism for your city, it's, Sometimes it's most effective when you are not necessarily pushing it too hard, right? So if you can kind of like cloak it in art or if you can like, you know, otherwise kind of let it sneak its way in. Nobody wants to feel guilty about what they don't know, but everybody wants to learn new things. Everybody wants to be challenged. Everyone wants where they live to kind of be constantly opening up in front of them in new ways every day. Like every, everyone wants that whether they know it or not. And I'm thinking about all of this and I'm like, so much about the city that people don't know. And I'm like, there's so much about the city that I don't know. Like I just, I need to accept that as a limitation. And this place is too complex. Like the creative community covers too large of a spectrum. It, this pro, like whatever I'm gonna start, it just, it can't just be through my lens. I know that like nothing can really be comprehensive, but if I'm like trying to do this by myself, it's just gonna sink the ship entirely, like before we even set sail. And I'm seeing some gaps on social media. I was spending a lot of time on Instagram. Um, that was kind of a language I knew how to speak. I understood hashtags, like I felt like I got that. And I've been rambling for a long time, but really what this kind of comes down to is that I, I would love to say there was like this lightning bolt moment or this like, aha, like this is the project I'm gonna start. But there just wasn't. There was just kind of all of those thoughts. There had been like the previous eight years of kind of like, you know, looking around online and kind of seeing gaps and throwing things at the wall and seeing what's stuck. Um, that's, that's really what a creative DC was. Um, and also there was just this, 
underlying, like I just knew, like I needed more access to the DC creative community. I was in and of it full time. If I needed more access, then other people did too. And so all of that just kind of became a creative DC. The project launched in January of 2015. I emailed about 80 people the week before it started, like a couple days before it went live. Um, I put a blog post up. I like back tagged about 40 of my own um, Instagram posts and just kind of let it go. And it worked. And it was just humbling and it was mind blowing and it, it just, it was working. Um, so we then kind of spent the first year liking as much of the content that was coming in as we could. That was kind of like our way of personally saying thank you. I left a lot of emoji comments. <laughs> you couldn't like heart like comments back then, but I would have if I could have. Um, and then from there, we just kind of came up with new and different ways to share the content. So it started out as an Instagram feed, but like very quickly, we realized that we were gonna have to kind of do a little bit better with this content that was coming in. So kind of back to the website, um, I wanna do a, a quick little team shout out, so thank you guys. Um, Pammy Carroll and Makita Solomon, um, and also uh, my sister Courtney Palmero, um, they worked on this project, um, they work on it today, they put a tremendous amount of like, love and talent into curating these galleries. Um, we also came up with ways to interact with our community in real life. So we worked with the DC Public Library Foundation for probably about a year and a half. We offered free uh, creative co-working days. It was kind of amazing. The libraries, the librarians there are fantastic. They would pull a bunch of like art books and things that people were personally interested in. Um, and once a month we would just come and we would hang out in this like part of uh, Martin Luther King Library, it's now Martin Luther King Junior Library, it's now being um, renovated. But Ayanna Zaire and Damon King were really integral in kind of making this successful for us, making it valuable for our community. Um, and we also came up with ways to kind of share the content from, from these events. So our anthology series, that's our ongoing portrait po project, you can access that online. Um, we've collaborated with a bunch of different photographers, um, and we've featured over 100 community members, 100 of DC's cultural contributors um, in this series so far. So we've also been able to work with a lot of amazing organizations like Destination DC, um, Think Local First, DC Department of Small and Local Business Development, Broccoli City Festival, Made in DC, Tutu Creates, um, a bunch of Smithsonian's, the Hirshhorn, um, and those have all been just incredibly exciting collaborations in the sense that it allowed us to reach new audiences. Sometimes we were able to kind of take content offline um, and just reach new people with it. So I know I keep saying we, um, and thank you for, for bearing with the rundown, the title credits there. Um, but obviously my team is amazing, um, but really I just wanna make sure that like I'm being so clear on this point, like this project and 700,000 pieces of creative content, like that's, every single one of those is a contribution. Every single one of those comes from a person or a project or an entity. Um, the, only pro the only reason that this project has succeeded and the only reason the mechanics of it work is because it is based around a community. It is for a community that was already doing the work. So there is talent here, there is endless talent, there is endless vision, um, there is a community, and there is an, eco an economy. Um, Creative DC, ultimately, all that we are is just one very visible access point to a lot of it, and we have built an audience whose size allows us to be a very loud champion of an ecosystem that exists with or without us. So I've used the word access about 400 times this morning. Um, it's one of the last things I wanna talk about because it is so important. Um, and again, there are just so many people and so many organizations in this city who are working on it because they know how vital it is. Um, Creative Mornings is one of them. Ooh, sorry guys. Creative Mornings is one of them. They are part of a global network of people. Again, like I'm so excited to be talking to you guys because you get it. There are cohorts in 173 other cities who get it. Um, DC has a $7.1 billion tourism industry. The media that comes out of these is hitting people like you. They are going to come here. They're going to demand a uniquely DC experience because they know that it exists. 
So that drives dollars into our neighborhoods, it drives it into local business, local galleries. That's happening because Creative Mornings is doing the online work of pointing to what is here. Candidly, um, so this is a panel series by Dim Sum Media um, that's headed up by a photographer, her name is Farah Skyke. She works with DC businesses on like social media content, sharing narrative. Um, a lot of her clients are people who are, you know, they're based here in DC, but they have a lot of visibility on the national level. So like think, you know, she's worked with Bad Saint and Columbia Room and Himitsu and a lot of people who were like nominated for like a lot of different things. Um, but in addition to that, she hosts these panels and these workshops and these classes where she makes her depth of knowledge available to other people who are in her industry. So this next one is about knowing your worth and getting paid in the creative economy. Um, it's coming up in September. It's got some phenomenal panel speakers. Um, skill in resource sharing, making knowledge available in the knowledge economy, that helps democratize opportunity in the creative economy as a whole. Um, we have to be talking, we have to be in the same room talking about uncomfortable shit like money. We have to be talking about the lack of affordable space. We have to talk about how hard it is to advocate for yourself. Like, she's doing some really good work getting people in the room. There are a lot of people doing this work. Um, I do think um, Dim Sum Media, like please sign up for their newsletter because I think they're doing an exceptionally good job of making sure that there are a lot of different voices involved when we're having that conversation. And lastly, we are back to my best friends, the DC Public Library <laughs> Foundation. Um, they're doing really important work on that same front. So what they're doing is providing, one of the many, many things they do is provide workforce training for this new workforce. So they're making computer training, Adobe program training, 3D printers, recording equipment, studio space, studio time. It's all free and available to anybody who has a library card. Um, and that's a step towards creating a more equitable creative economy and a more equitable just economy in general. Um, DC's wealth needs to be distributed to more people in more parts of the city. And our creative community is, you know, we're, we're part of that and we, we bear that responsibility as well. Um, our creative economy is not emerging, it's not new, but it is growing really, really rapidly. Um, the library's vision of DC includes everyone. So there are people that I can definitely get behind. They're an organization I think is worthy of everybody's support. Um, their annual Uncensored event is coming up at the end of September. Um, it's centered around Banned Books Week. It's one of the biggest fundraising opportunities that they have every year. I would love to see you guys there. Um, I really, I wanna keep like using this opportunity to kind of like tell you guys about more things that I am you know, really happy to have in my media sphere, um, but I'm not going to because I I think I'm headed towards time. Um, but I do want to quickly shout out Pink Line Project, Dirt DMV, all the Fly Kids, DC Web Fest, Transformers Online Flat File Store. These are all people who are using different online platforms to fill gaps in new media. Everybody I just mentioned, because I know I have been saying a lot, um, everybody I mentioned, all the photos I used today, everything is up now on a creativedc.com backslash creative mornings. I mean, if you head to Twitter, I'm like about to put something up. I think if I do it right now, I will just lose all my marbles. Um, but I'm gonna put it up after this. Um, I would love for you guys to just tweet back at us, like who's doing the work? Who do you feel like deserves more of a platform? Um, and we're gonna share that back out with our audience. So at the risk of kind of ending all of this on like a cloud of feelings um, and like another really long ramble, I'm going to do it anyways. Um, <laughs> This city's creative narrative requires diversity in and of media. It's too large and it's too complex to tell this entire story just through tra traditional media, just through social media, just through online media. It can't be told through one channel. It can't be told from one person's perspective. It requires community over competition. It requires contributions. It requires that you pitch in with what you're good at and that you trust that the person next to you is doing the same thing. It requires finding and supporting these other people who are doing their thing. It requires listening and looking and eyes peeled. It requires lending your voice and it requires a lot more resources than it currently has. So because of that, we're not gonna get resources unless we are loud, so please be loud about the work that you are doing here. Lend your visibility, 
Shout that you are from DC, especially if you have a national platform. Partner with people who do what you cannot. Work towards solutions using the tools that you have. Because your voice creates access to something much, much larger than yourself. Without question, all of our creative existences in Washington, DC, declaring this city as more and as other than just the federal government, which just has defined us for forever and will keep defining us unless we say otherwise, that is an inherently political act, and it's one that we are all in together. Thank you guys so much. I think I blacked out. <laughs> Thank you.